Hello, my name is Yovana Morris. I'm a transactional attorney for Hyundai Motor America and also the chair of its African-American employee resource group we call Hyundai Soul. We are proud to sponsor this online series, A Seat at My Sister's Table, a conversation with Black women. Hyundai is committed to diversity and inclusion, which includes a commitment to issues that face the Black community and us Black women in particular. As a Black woman, a mother, wife, daughter, and sister, I know firsthand the value of having a table where we can discuss our issues, concerns, and experiences. The importance of sisterhood has been key to our journey in the American experience. The current issues that have plagued our country in the last several weeks are unprecedented. In a span of just a few months, we experienced a global pandemic, economic crisis, and racial protests not seen since the 1960s. Dealing with these tragic events such as these aren't new for us. Since the founding of our nation, through an era of segregation and to the modern calls for social justice, Black women have always been at the front of any lasting change. That's why this conversation is necessary. We see you, we stand with you, and we applaud you for the work you do in strengthening our communities. Thank you to the Save a Girl, Save a World organization for putting this together. I look forward to the discussion. Hi, I'm Glenda Hill, founder of Save a Girl, Save a World, a multifaceted intergenerational mentoring organization serving students at several HBCUs. Our mentoring model represents what we call a triad, where adult mentors mentor college students, college students mentor high school girls from the surrounding community. It's an each one, reach one, and teach one model. Our organization foundation is represented by four pillars health and wellness, lifestyles and leadership, career and entrepreneurship, and financial literacy and legacy. Today we're here highlighting an initiative, a seat at my sister's table. We're here with our mentors sharing their voices on the current cultural climate and to express and speak as voices of change for the future. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Hyundai Motor North America for supporting Save a Girl, Save a World throughout the years and providing this platform for us. I'd also like to thank our partner, Cafe Mocha. To learn more about Save a Girl, please visit www.saveagirlsaveaworld.org. I'll close with a quote by Bell Hooks. If we give our children sound self love, they will be able to deal with whatever life puts before them. We are here today giving our young women sisterly love. Hi. I'm Casey Wilborn Snap. And I'm Latasha Weatherall. And together we are a seat at my sister's table. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. So on behalf of a seat at my sister's table, we'd like to thank Hyundai Motors North America for your presence and your voice in the struggle for black Americans. We must say his name, George Floyd. And we must continue to protect her and say her name, Breonna Taylor. But always, we must continue the fight and the journey to say the words, freedom. Because Black lives matter. So excited to be hosting this amazing round table sponsored by Save a Girl, Save a World in partnership and sponsorship with Hyundai Motors North America. So happy to be here. Um, we're gonna be having a conversation with five HBCU students. We're gonna jump right in a minute, but we're gonna be talking about, um, it's a virtual round table on reimagining and course correcting the violence and economic parity against Blacks in the wake of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And so we're happy to have you with us. You'll be hearing from some very amazing HBCU collegiates. And let me just go ahead and bring them in and introduce them to you quickly. Hi girls, how are you? Hi. That's good, you can wave, you can wave. 
we have with us today very excited to introduce them i'm going to ask you girls to share your names i'm going to introduce you and then tell us what school you are attending and what is your major and what is your interest okay so first things first i'm going to have miss tajiri can you please um share with us what school you attend what year you're in and what your major is Yes, so I attend Clarkland University. I am a rising senior and my major is psychology. Excellent, Tajiri. Great field. I am a psychology degree holder, so I'm a big, big, big fan of people in behavioral science. Uh, let's keep moving. Damaris, please share with us um, the school you attend, your major, and what year you're in. Hello, everyone. My name is Damaris, as she said. Um, I go to East Carolina University. And I'm a psychology major as well with a concentration in neuroscience and I'm a rising senior. Yay, Damaris, I got two behavioral scientists on the line. I'm so excited about that. Cameron, tell us about you. What school do you attend? What's your major? And uh, tell us a little bit more, tell us. So I attended Clark Atlanta University. I actually graduated this year. I got my degree in business marketing and my interest is pretty much beauty. I already have my own company. So that's what I would like to develop my career in. Yay, Cameron. Congratulations. Happy class Thank 2020. You. We are so, so proud of you, Cameron. Thank you. Congratulations. And you look amazing. Um, Thank all of you, you do look beautiful. <laughs> um, next we have Aravia. Aravia, please tell us what school you attend. What's your major? Tell us a little bit about you. Hi, I'm a second year uh, master of public health student at Morehouse School of Medicine, and my interest is maternal and child health. Outstanding, Aravia. Thank you so much for being with us. You look beautiful. And Queen Joanna Fay, could you please tell us what school you attend and what your major is? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Queen Joanna Fay Tervalon. I just graduated from Clark Atlanta University and uh, with a degree in political science. And I am going to Emory University in the fall to study um, uh, to get my Master's of Divinity. So this, I'll be a first year student. Outstanding. I am so proud of you all. Again, we'd like to thank Hyundai for being our sponsor today to host this very, very, very important conversation. When you say ladies, is a very important conversation today. And so I'm so glad to have you all. So you can see these are some very beautiful, bright, amazing young women. And they certainly have some insight and some ideas and some thoughts about what's been happening since the civil unrest uh, after the, I would call it post Floyd. Um, post Breonna Taylor, post uh, George Floyd, uh, post Aubrey. There's been so many posts. We hate to keep listing them, but we want you to know we will say their names throughout this round table. I'm going to start off with one question right away. And I want you guys to each answer. I want you to think about this. How has the current civil unrest affected you personally and your community? Um, how about you answer that for me, Damaris? How has it affected you personally and your community? Um, personally, it's definitely been very stressful, very um, disheartening to see all of the things that are currently going on, of course, on social media, um, on TV. It's just, it's saddening. I mean, that, you know, constantly we've still been dealing with the same things that um, our, our ancestors have been throughout the years. I mean, it's like... <laughs> we should be further than this but um yeah me personally it's been very saddening um in my community i think we're all just grieving at this point in time um grieving the loss of our brothers and sisters that have you know um, been killed been murdered at the hands of these police officers and also just grieving our situation and that we're even having to be subjected subjected to this at this point in time Thank you so much, Damaris. Queen Jonah Fay, share the same question. Could you give me your response? How is it affecting you currently? How is it affecting your community? How is it affecting your family? How is this civil unrest? And I know you're originally from New Orleans. Is that not correct, Jonah Fay? Yes. So Queen, tell mm -hmm. us about that. Um. So yes, yeah, so for me, um, I think that this is a very interesting time to be a part of. Um, like, despite, you know, it's just, chaotic i think that it's also really good because i think people like me who wanted to um move from you know learning about political theory and all these all these theories and uh civil um civil disobedience 
things that we learn in political science classes. Um, me and a lot of my classmates have wanted to go from learning about these things on paper and then to actually um, apply these things in real life. And I think that this is a wake up call for people who have been uh, previously not active. And I think that this is like an opportunity for us to finally put into place some of these things that we've been theorizing about for so long. So it's, it's almost hopeful in a way because it's like, okay, wow, people are starting to finally get it and finally starting to do something about it. Cause we've all talked about, you know, banning, disbanding the police. We've talked about that before in the seventies um, till now, but then I feel like now is a push for it to actually come into fruition. And that's actually exciting because it's, it's about time for us to stop holding on to these old systems that hasn't worked for since they've started. So it's exciting, but then also um, it's a wake up call for a lot of people, including myself to actually start being active and stop being just a reader. Outstanding. Thank you, Queen Jonah Fay. Cameron, the same question for you. How has the civil unrest affected you directly, affected your community, your family? Tell us a little bit more about that, Cameron. Well, I am actually from um, Lexington, Kentucky, and, you know, Louisville is about an hour away, and actually hearing what happened to Breonna Taylor, it was very heartbreaking, and, you know, on top of what was going on with George Floyd. But um, it's definitely upsetting, it's heartbreaking, but I do think that everyone or some people should not just focus on George Floyd because Breonna Taylor was murdered before him, but also his murderers have been convicted, and I think that, you know, we can't lose focus on, you know, convicting Breonna Taylor's murderers. And, you know, like I said, that's an hour away from me. So it definitely affected me in a way thinking that that could have been me. That could have been anybody. And it's just very scary, you know, the times that we're living in. But um, like Queen said, I really am glad that a lot of people are getting it now and are, and are trying to do something to change the problem. Thank you so much, Cameron. Tajiri, what do you, how do you feel? How has it affected you? This current unrest affected you, affected your community. Tell us a little bit more about the effects on you. Um, personally, I would say it's heavy. It's a very heavy feeling. Like anytime we see these murders happen and these names and hashtags pop up. So I think personally, I have just been dealing with the trauma of seeing that over and over again. Um, and I, as far as community, I think that we are all collectively grieving. But at the same time, um, I'm seeing a lot of good things like from my community, I'm seeing people um, contribute money to mutual aid funds and bail funds and people having these conversations about abolition and um, liberation that weren't really happening like in mass the way it is now a few years ago. So similar to what Queen said, I feel very hopeful um, at the same time, despite everything that's going on. Thank you so much, Tajiri. Aravia, you weigh in on this. We want to hear from you. How has the civil unrest really affected you currently and your community as well? Um, for me, it was a lot to see, like they said, people um, dying in the videos of people getting shot down poli by police on social media. So I definitely have to take a social media break. And for me and my family, we've been having more conversations about how do we prepare ourselves to interact with the police and what do we do if we are you know, out and protesting and how do you also protect yourself during a pandemic while out protesting and, you know, showing that you stand in solidarity with all these other people. So that was definitely a big conversation. I think for my community, we're trying to figure out how we can go from the classroom. So taking what we learn in the classroom and really stand with each other in the communities and how, what can we do to make our communities better? Thank you so much, Aravia. Ladies, I'm going to move to my next question for you. And I, I'm so inspired by your answers thus far. Do you think um, the current protest models, and we're gonna talk about, I love how Queen said in the beginning that you studied this in school, right? You studied all of these different concepts around protests, around civil unrest, and then who would have known that organically, unfortunately, this would happen in real time, in your real lives, and you would have to take theory and see how it fits into practice. So the question right here is, do you think that the current pro protest models and activism are different from the civil rights movement? And if so, if you do think it's different, 
why is it different or how is it different? Let me start off with Arabia. Arabia, do you think that these protest models are different than what you studied in school or what you heard about, what your parents shared with you? You think this current model is different? And if so, how or why? Um, I don't really think it's different. I think now um, a lot of people are turning to influencers and wanting them to stand up and take a stand on everything. I think now maybe the difference, maybe social media. So I think people are more connected through social media and using social media and their platforms to really get the message out there. But I think that it's probably still the same. Okay, thanks, Arabia. What about you, Cameron? Do you think it's uh, different from the civil rights movement from what you witnessed or what you saw in history records? Do you think it's different? And if so, what's different? Um, I really feel like it's pretty much the same. I feel like violence is still the same. It's still happening even when the protests are going on. I just feel like um, how damaging the violence could be to people is just not the same as it was, you know, previously. So I think that, um, yeah, they're pretty much the same to me. Okay. Okay. Tajiri, how do you feel about that? I think as far as um, organizing those and um, protesting in order to disrupt like business as usual and status quo, I think it's pretty similar. I think now though, that I think that we are losing like the respectability politics or trying to steer away from this, but respectability politics around um, our anger and how we should voice our anger and how we should protest, um, which I think is a good thing. Okay, thank you, Tajiri. Damaris, I see you shaking your head, yes. So give me your take on protest models. Do you think this protest model from what you saw historically, you know, on every, you know, um, news show when they would talk about how the protests went back during King days and back during, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer, you think this protest, mod protest model is different? And if so, how or why? Um, I do think it is a bit different um, simply because the wealth of resources and knowledge that we now have that wasn't necessarily afforded to um, people back then um, has kind of shifted our perspective. So whereas it's, it's kind of a both and type of thing. So yes, you do have people marching and you do have people um, actively in the street serving. You also have people on the back end who are building generational wealth, who are just doing a number of different things that maybe our ancestors really um, didn't have the means to do. Um, and I definitely think that that's still a form of protest, um, not necessarily being on the front lines, but kind of doing some of the back end, the legwork, um, kind of back in the background. It's also a form of protest. So it's a little bit different, um, but also it still is sort of the same. Okay. Thank you so much, Damaris. Uh, Queen Jonah Faye, do you think it's different? You talked a little bit earlier about how when you were in classes as a political science major, you guys studied the protest models. Is it the same, Queen Jonah Faye, or is it a little different? And if it is, in what way? I'm going to say one person's name, Ella Baker. Ella yes. Baker, um, if you are an, an unfamiliar with the name, she was one of the, um, the organizers that start she was like the elder for the SNCC movement the student nonviolent coordinating committee and Ella Baker she if you study her work she was very much pro decentralized leadership and so she wasn't a fan of the charismatic leader but she was a fan of like people doing the movement work without the glory of what it is to be you know like a leader in a spotlight and so i think that with the black lives matter movement as well as the protests going on it has a similar model because there, there are people who are on the ground working in New Orleans, working in uh, Louisville, working in Minneapolis, working in like Los Angeles, Oakland. And we don't know their names per se, you know, nationally, but at the same time they're doing the work. And so I think that it has a lot of similarities between it. I think one of the differences is media. So media then was used as a tactic for the news media was used as a tactic to uh, shed light on how People were being treated, how black people were being treated um, by police getting hose, you know, hoses, water hoses on them, dogs sicked on them. But now the media has their own, um, you know, there's different media outlets that has their own agenda and their own um, audience that they cater to. But now we have social media. And so now we can see that what the media portrays versus what 
actually happens is two different things. And so I think social media in this case has been our greatest tool and our greatest ally because it's not filtered by, you know, getting the most ratings on a news outlet. And so I think that that's one of the differences. Uh, news media isn't what we rely on, but it's really social media, me social media, media because it is um, a lot more un is unfiltered and a lot more unbiased, which is more important than what the news media has been covering. As black women, do you feel this movement will impact gender equality in any way? And if so, how will this particular movement impact black women? And if so, how, ladies? Cameron, let me start with you, Cameron. Do you think this movement um, will affect black women? I don't think it would affect, well, I think it would affect us emotionally, you know, with everything that we've been seeing happening today. But I don't think that, um, I don't think anything will change as far as the pedestal that men are put on and what women are put on. I feel like men, you know, they are killed more by police. And I think that, you know, now that it's actually starting to happen to not just men, but women as well, hopefully, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement can also you know, bring gender equality, you know, when police brutality is happening on both ends. Thank you, Cameron. Damaris, you're shaking your head. Do you think that this movement will affect black women as it relates to gender equality? So personally, I believe that a justice for black people in general is justice for everyone. So even when it pertains to the LGBT community, um, black women, I've, I truly believe that if black people as a whole uh, collectively get the justice and get the rights that they deserve, I feel like everything else is going to fall into place after that. Um, so I do feel like it will, will affect black women, particularly, especially when it pertains to, you know, the pay gaps. Um, I think that people are going to start, you know, recognizing those disparities and those gaps, um, even when it comes to you know, the gaps between people in the medical field and how, you know, black women only make up 2% uh, of those, all the physicians in the United States. Those things are gonna start coming to light more and more as they already have been. And um, I think people are gonna start actively doing things to change those things. So I do believe that the things that are happening right now are just setting us up to make a better change um, for black Thank women in particular. Thank you so much, Damaris. Arabia, I got to come to you because she talked about medicine and you're currently matriculating at Morehouse School of Medicine. And I want to hear from you. Do you think that this movement will impact black women's gender equality, especially since you're studying to become a physician? Um, I don't think so. Uh, from what I've noticed and from what I've studied, a lot of the civil rights movements have really led to the erasure of black women's experiences um, and especially like in the medical but a lot of black women don't get the pay or the credit that they're due um, and even with the whole um, like Henrietta Lack story a lot of black women have led to the evolution of medicine whether they gave their permission or not and they still have not received credit but for the civil rights the current movements that's going on a lot of the issues are really focused on black men and I understand that as a you know, a culture and a people, we want liberation for all black people, but I don't want the liberation of black people to mean black liberation for black men and the oppression of black women. And while we're talking about black women, there have been a lot of, as always, there have been a lot of killings and murders and brutality of black trans women, but those stories are never told either. So I don't think that there's going to be a change in gender equality. Thank you so much for being so candid. Tajri, you got to weigh in on this, sweetie. Do you honestly think that this movement currently will have an impact on gender equality for black women? For me, it's not even a question of like, will it? I think that it must. Like this movement won't be a successful movement if we don't center black women. Um, if we don't start being honest about um, the oppressive, the oppression that black women face um, as a collective, not only because black women are the movement, like black women have been at the forefront of every social and civil rights movement in history. Um, but because to be truly fighting for black liberation, you have to be including black women um, who are the most marginalized group. So 
I think we have to. Thank you, Tajiri. Queen Jonah Fay, can you answer that? Can you give us your take on, is this movement going to have any effect on gender equality for black women? So if the frame, I think if the framework is police brutality, we have, we still have a lot of work to do because um, I just watched a video um, from Kimberly Crenshaw and she did a TED talk and she uh, discussed, she listed names that we all know, like, um, you know, Tamir Rice, Mike Brown, Trayvon Martin. She had listed all of these people who were uh, victims of police brutality. And she asked the people to sit down if you didn't hear the name. And so she mentioned um, black males who've been um, murdered by police and a majority of the room were standing up. But then when she started naming women who were murdered by police, then every, almost everyone sat down instantly by the first name and myself included, I did not know who the, who these women are right now. I just really know Breonna Taylor and I know a few other stories, but I can't really say their, the, the black women's names. Um, and I'm also not uh, familiar with all the trans women who's also been murdered uh, during this time. So I think that if it's in the framework of police brutality, there's still a lot of work to do. And so um, just like Tajri said, it must center black women, including trans women, because, um, you know, for Black women, we have to do the emotional labor of watching our sons getting killed, our daughters getting killed, our cousins, uncles, brothers. Um, we have emotional labor. And then also because we fight for everyone to, to, to fight for everyone and simultaneously be ignored at the same time, that is something that's just atrocious like in itself so it definitely we definitely have some work to do in the framework of police brutality but um if this movement is is intersectional like this is an anti-capitalist movement that comes out of this this is anti um anti big government anti uh, just all these things that we are asking to be just oh anti-police um that we're asking to be disbanded and then i think it, it will eventually um, trickle down. But I think right now in, in the framework that we have now, it needs to evolve before it includes women's equality. Thank you so much, Queen Jonah Faye. Ladies, we're coming to the end of our round table. And I will have to tell you that I have been so thrilled to hear just your remarks and your thoughts. You all, you know, I'm, I'm partial because I love my Saver Girl girls. Um, so I think you all are rock stars anyway. But I'm so grateful that this was an opportunity to hear your thoughts in real time because these things are still happening. It's not yet history, so to speak. We're still organically in real time. And to hear your thoughts at this moment and to know how these things are applying to your current lives is absolutely gripping. And so I am so proud. And you see, I'm wearing my Save a Girl t-shirt I see that Queen Jonas Faye has her Saver Girl t-shirt. Anybody else rocking their Saver Girl t-shirt? I see Tajri, I see Arabia, and Cameron. Demara says, my Saver Girl t-shirt is in my spirit. Yours is in your spirit, right, Demara? <laughs> so you don't have to have yours on, but we're, you know, we're part of the petty crew. We had to wear ours. Um, last question, girls, before we wrap up. But again, I can't thank Hyundai enough for seeing it fit to put us in a position to share our thoughts and our ideas as black women, um, as collegiates, as, as graduates. Um, thank you so much, Hundy. Thank you so much for a seat at my sister's table for Casey Wilburn and that whole team. And thank you so much to Glenda Gill, executive director and founder of Save a Girl, Save a World. Here's our last question. And it goes like this, what role, and I cannot wait to hear your responses, what role should HBCUs play in support of social justice, activism, and economic parity? Okay, what roles should HBCUs play in support of social justice, activism, and economic parity? That's our final question for the round table. I'm gonna to go to you, Miss Queen Jonah Faye, because you were our political science major now going mm -hmm. into Emory University for Divinity. Mm -hmm. Let's hear from you. What role should the HBCU play in activism, social justice, and economic parity? Queen Jonah Faye. This has been my favorite question because this is my career path. This is what I'm dedicating my career to is HBCU education and leadership. And so, um, for HBCUs, I think it's so great 
that HBCUs exist and that we have been thriving in all these years. And I think the role that HBCUs to play is to prepare, HBCUs should prepare, um, prepare the fight against racial injustice, gender inequality, um, a lack of LGBTQ um, inclusion, all of these things that we know that exist. HBCUs have been preparing people to um, to combat all these different um, intersections, intersecting systems of oppression. And so um, what HBCUs should do now is to continue to um, educate not only their students, but also the community. So this is a time for HBCUs to um, really learn about the communities around them and really get involved in, in every community and whatever HBCU it is, get involved in the community as if the community was a part of the school and enrolled in the school. It's time for um, HBCUs to make sure that they are a safe place and a safe haven for all Black people. And naturally, a safe haven for all Black people is a safe haven for all people um, who are accepting of uh, all Black people. And so um, HBCUs need to educate people on, we should be educating our students on how to own homes, how to own businesses, where to find, how to finance um, business loans, how to, um, how to build credit, how to do all these different things that you won't learn at a normal school, but at an HBCU, we should be teaching Black people how to combat these systems of oppression without having to constantly fight to you know, ask white people to say that we matter, but no, it should be, okay, so I know that for me as an educated black person at an HBCU, my school has equipped me to combat racism in a way that's beneficial to me and then my community that's not, um, that's not, drain and you know, how, as draining as it could be to just yell and state Black Lives Matter and have someone combat that. So I think that and that's the way that they could do it. Thank you so much, Queen Joanna Faye. Here you go. You know, guys, just for people who may not be familiar with the acronym HBCU, we know that that means historically black college and universities. And so we want to hear from you, Damaris. How should HBCUs support? What is the role of HBCUs and what should they do to support social justice, activism, and economic parity, Damaris? So I definitely agree with pretty much everything Queen said. Um, I think it's very important that HBCUs continue to foster black excellence. Um, as a student currently at a predominantly white institution, I used to go to Bennett College for high school. Um, I see the importance of having that HBCU experience. I see the importance of um, what an HBCU brings in, in terms of instilling self-love instilling confidence into their students, which um, quite frankly, you do not get at a predominantly white institution because that is not their, the culture of the institution. Um, so I definitely think that it's important that, you know, um, HBCUs continue to lead the charge in um, churning out black students who want to do great things. Um, I definitely agree with Queen um, with her saying that they should start teaching um, black people in particular, black students in particular, more about you know buying owning a home um, entrepreneurship those types of things so that we can start creating black wealth for ourselves which is honestly going to be the pivotal thing that we need to turn this thing around to turn racism around to turn the black community around um as a whole so um i definitely agree with everything that she said and i think that's how um hbcus can definitely um, continue to cultivate excellence, cultivate black excellence. Thank you so much, Damaris. And you know, I'm partial because I am a graduate of an HBCU, Bowie State University in Maryland, the oldest HBCU in the state of Maryland. Don't get it confused. It is not Morgan State, it is not Coppin State. It is Bowie State University that is the oldest HBCU in Maryland. Let me keep moving forward as we wrap this up. <clears throat> How should HBCUs, should HBCUs, what's the role, Tajiri, for HBCUs as it relates to supporting social justice, activism, and economic parity? So I think the first thing that our HBCUs can do, um, especially since it's such a big like topic um, and issue right now is divest from 
police and in any partnerships that they have with the local police forces um, in the community and try to invest in building transformative like justice systems um, within our schools. I think that if any school, any kind of school should know um, the history of the police and how harmful they can be um, to us as black students, it should be us at an HBCU who can do that work and lead on that work um, and getting rid of these parcel ideas of punishment and introducing like transformative justice um, and community healing um, and community accountability. I think that, that our schools also have a responsibility to go out into our communities because a lot of our HBCUs sit as like ivory towers in these communities where around us people are impoverished um, and in food deserts and going without. And I think that our HBCUs really have to sit and think about how they are contributing to our communities. Um, and then the last thing I would say is just to educate us. Um, I think that, yes, HBCUs do, do give us a lot of understanding of race, um, more so than, than what we would have had we had gone to a PWI. But if my understanding of race is not including capitalism, if it's not including misogyny um, and sexism, if it's not including um, sexuality and how it affects LGBTQ plus people, um, then my understanding of race is not that deep. And so I think that our HBCUs can do a better job at teaching us about racism from an intersectional viewpoint of one that is truly intersectional um, and giving us a politic around liberation and um, like black freedom, so. Tajiri, I can't stop smiling. You ladies just make me so proud just so that we can be certain that those who are viewing this understand all of our acronyms so that you understand that PWIs do stand for predominantly white institutions. Um, we don't wanna assume that everyone understands the alphabet soup that we use in academia. Um, I gotta hear from you, Cameron. I gotta hear from you, Aravia. And again, the final question was what role should HBCUs play in support of social justice, activism, and economic parity. Cameron, can I hear from you? Yes, um, I feel that HBCUs, um, they should educate us on how to deal with the things that we've dealt with for so many years, but it's different now how it's been shaped over the years. I think that, you know, they expose us to the material and they expose us to the things that have happened in the past and what has been done to lead us up to this point of being, you know, equal in some ways. Um, we should be, you know, taught on how to deal with things that are happening now because certain things that are happening now didn't really happen, you know, a lot back then. I feel like, you know, a lot of things are happening more so now, like the police brutality and the killings of our black men and women. So I just feel like the HBCUs should definitely educate our young people on how to deal with certain things, you know, not just expose them to what's happening. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you so much, Cameron. Arabia. You're gonna bring us home. You're gonna you're gonna <laughs> close up this 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 talk, this roundtable. I have so much confidence in all of you. Aravia, as a training physician, I need to hear from you. You went from an HBCU for undergrad into an HBCU for medical school, and yes. so I would love to hear from you as we close this thing out. How should HBCUs play a supportive role? as it relates to social justice, activism, and economic parity, Arabia. I think from my experience from t attending two different HBCUs in Bennett and Moore High School of Medicine are totally different. Um, I think a lot of HBCUs probably should do more in reconnecting and revitalizing the communities around them. I know at Morehouse we do a lot of revitalization. There's a lot of gentrification going on in the West End of Atlanta, but like um, Tajri said, a lot of the communities are impoverished and experiencing food deserts. So I think the school should really do more to really put back into the communities that serve them. And for activism, I think they should really focus on educating students. We know HBCs educate students, educating them on the types of racism and how life is going to be for them as a person of color trying to succeed in America in a really a society that doesn't want them to, to see them win at all. And really focusing on the intersectionalities of their of the experiences of all kinds of Black people, um, you know, LGBTQ people, straight people, women, men, people that are gender non-conforming, and really honing in on how they can use their specific gifts and talents to really push their own perspective 
and a perspective forward that really will liberate all people, regardless of their gender and other isms that they may um, experience. Aravia, that was brilliant. I have been blown away by my Saver Girl, Saver Girl women. Um, I cannot thank Hyundai enough. Let's give Hyundai some hands, ladies, for being so on point. Come on, Cameron. Come on, Queen. Come on, everybody. <laughs> give Hyundai some hands because this was a blessing and a gift from Hyundai. Um, we also want to thank all of the amazing women at a seat at my sister's table. We love you. Let's give them a hand, ladies. Come on, work with me. Work with me. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> We're getting our virtual thank yous on. And last but not least, and I saved her for last because oftentimes the visionary can get lost um, in the midst of such great work. I want to give the visionary of Save a Girl, Save a World just a round of just hands. Miss Glenda Gill, we want to thank Glenda Gill for Save a Girl, Save a World. We love you, Glenda Gill, for being so um, fearless in your work as an uh, organization that mentors uh, in a very cross-sectional way having um, corporate, college, and high school girls in a triad mentoring um, uh, experience. My two daughters are a part of Save a Girl, Save a World. I have a daughter who just finished her freshman year at Prairie View A&M. And then I have a rising junior who's finishing up high school. And so it means so much to me to be a part of the Save a Girl, Save a World family. Again, I have been your humble host for Save a Girl, Save a World and a seat at my sister's table, the round table dealing with the current civil unrest. And I am so grateful. I'm Michelle, the indie mom of comedy. And I want to thank everyone who is doing their part. And as the girl said, there are so many heroes currently working on the front lines. And we want to thank every nameless, faceless hero who is out there on the front lines. Um, being fearless. And we also want to thank those who don't look like us. I think for me, as I close this out, ladies, I want to make a remark that this is probably one of the first times that you've seen so many groups, diverse ethnic groups of people coming together in England and Australia and Amsterdam, coming together on behalf of Black lives really mattering in the world. And so I want to thank all those fearless nameless people. Again, I've been Michelle, the indie mom of comedy. You can follow me at Michelle Comedy on all of my platforms. I want to thank Hyundai. I want to thank Save a Girl, Save a World. And I want to thank a seat at my sister's table. You all take good care. And we're looking forward to sharing this information with you.